Hi, and welcome to New Scandinavian Cooking from Hörnefoss in eastern Norway. I'm Andreas Vistad. It's October, and while the rest of the country is preparing for a long and hard winter and nature is going into hibernation, this is the highlight of the year here in the Ringerike in the inland region. It's a time for the annual moose hunt and for the potato harvest. I'll start off by making a hot infusion. Think of it as a tea of the forest with juniper, lingonberries and blueberries. Then I'll go hunting for the king of the forest, the moose. I'll use the moose heart and serve it with chanterelle mushrooms, cream and berries. Right in the outskirts of the forest there are hundreds of thousands of workers that work all summer to ensure that we have good crops and help pollinate the heather in the forest as well. I'm referring to the bees. They are essential for life and with such a sweet result. I'll use three different types of honey to make a honey ice cream. And then there are the local potatoes. Ringerich's potatoes, small strange looking potato that's difficult to grow and that has low yields but that tastes delicious. I'm going to use it to make a rich potato gratin with local cheeses and roast mousse. It's autumn, but there are still edible treasures to be found in the forest. And I'm going to start off by making an infusion of forest berries here. I have lingonberries and blueberries here. I've got a teapot full of juniper, juniper sprigs and juniper berries. Some are ripe and some are unripe. Then I just pour the berries into the chamber where you normally have the tea leaves and also a teaspoon or two of dried lingonberries. You can also use cranberries. And then boiling water. Ah! I just let it infuse for a couple of minutes. Then I just pump up and down a few times just to release the flavor from the berries and also some of the color. And it's fresh tasting and tart and it smells of the forest and of autumn. You can also use other trees and other berries. You could use spruce. In the spring you could use young birch trees and just some dried berries as well. So this is a template on many different kinds of infusions. You can find all the recipes at our website newscancook.com It is time for the annual moose hunt and I'm off to meet Tudid. She's been waiting all summer for this. How long have you been hunting? I've been with my father hunting since I was about six years old, but I, was, I wasn't hunting that time. I was sleeping in my sleeping bag <laughs> beside him. And there's a big social element to, to the hunt, isn't it? For me, at least, it's that it's more about being with all these people because they kind of become my family, you know. Yeah. I grew up with them. Uh, yeah. But one thing that strikes me as odd is that at one point there was this big ox within shooting range and you didn't shoot him. Why? First of all, I might not be the big like hunter that shoots on everything I see, but the principle is that we, we don't shoot the big ox in the beginning of the hunt because we have these um, breeding sessions for them. That's a very sort of Darwinistic uh, way of, of being gentle <laughs> to that particular animal. That's the way of seeing it. Mm. One of the first things that has to be done after a successful hunt is to eat the heart of the animal. That is something that has an enormous symbolic importance. To eat the heart of an animal is to show that you've conquered it, but it's also a way to honor it. I also think that it's important to note that it makes sense from a gastronomic point of view. Whereas the meat needs to hang and mature for a few days, the heart is at its very best when it's very fresh. Ah. 
Can I borrow your knife? Thank you. Cooking heart is really incredibly simple. You just fry it in the pan a couple of minutes. I'm adding some red onions and some chanterelles. This is the last chanterelle mushrooms of the season. And season with a little bit of salt and pepper. Then I just add a good splash of cream, full fat cream. There's no, no point in being low calorie when you're in the woods hunting. And some lingonberries just for some uh, acidity, some scallion, spring onion. This forest is in a way the beginning of the world's largest forest. It's a spruce forest that stretches all the way into Siberia, all the way to the Pacific Ocean. And spruce is really not just the national tree of Norway, but it smells great and it tastes great, at least in small quantities. If you don't have spruce, you can also use sage. Oh, hi. From the spice, For the... That reproduction is essential to the life of animals and humans is something that we take for granted. But that the same applies to plants is often forgotten or neglected. But every raspberry flower that blooms in spring longs to become a raspberry. Every cabbage flower or pea flower longs to be pollinated and to become what it is destined to. But very often, the plants can't do it themselves, they need help, help from bees. That's why Eric keeps seven beehives on his property. Eric runs the farm alone with his wife and two daughters. But most of the workers here are not humans, they are bees. He has nearly 300,000 of them. It smells fantastic. Yes, it's the most aromatic honey, the heather honey that comes late in the season, like mm. now. Can I taste? Yeah, of course. Just take your finger down there and okay. you get honey on it. Okay. How sweet it is. <laughs> mm. I like honey, but this is something special. Is it because your honey is extra good or is it the fact that I'm tasting it straight off of the honeycomb? <laughs> well, that is really fresh. That makes it taste a lot, of course, but also the area where my farm is in makes the honey very yeah. good. And it also has a lot of different flavors. What do you mean different flavors? From year to year and through the year to the seasons, it tastes different. Do you want to taste? Yes, absolutely. This one is what we call the virgin honey. It's a, the, the one we harvest first mm -hmm. in early summer. It's still quite runny. Mm. It's mild. Uh, but it's quite complex. You can't really track down what it tastes like. No, I think that's because it comes from a lot of different kinds of flowers that flower early in summer. Mm. And uh, What about this? This is a typical uh, raspberry honey. Okay. It's uh, very creamy and... Mm. Hmm. Yeah, it has a almost like berry, berry-like yeah. uh, flavor. It just tastes like summer. On a, <laughs> I think so. on a summer day. Yeah. It smells like this. For me, that is a honey enthusiast. That's the taste of summer. Mm. And, and this one is, is much, much darker. Yeah. This is a, a, a full honey. So that's, this is more or less the same that we've tasted. Yeah, that's the same honey. It's the latest honey that we harvest and uh, it's a heather honey. Mm. And that means that in late summer, there are no more flowers in That's the farm, right. so they have to cross the road. Yeah, <laughs> cross in. the road. It's uh, not far. No, it's, it's just over there. But, yeah. but they collect mainly here from, from the forest. Yes, that's right. Mm. This, I think, is my favorite in a way. And, and this is the most Scandinavian, at least, because um, it uses some of the plants that we have a lot of here that yes. don't grow well um, 
further south. Yeah, I think this is a typical Norwegian honey. Mm. I'm going to use all of them, I think, in my <laughs> cooking. It's a wonderful. It's really wonderful. Pernafoss is a town situated around some falls, and these falls are called Chicken Falls for completely different reasons, but I've always associated it with chicken, and now, finally, I'm going to make chicken soup by the Chicken Falls. And the base of this delicious chicken soup is a fantastic chicken stock made with old hens. And I've got a wonderful recipe that takes a bit of time, but it's not very labor intensive. You simply put a chicken or an old hen in water together with bay leaf and a couple of black peppercorns. And you put the pot in the oven at somewhat below boiling temperature. So around 90, 95 degrees Celsius or 200 Fahrenheit. And you leave it for 24 hours. Then you remove the chicken, add a new chicken. Leave it for 24 hours, then you remove the chicken, add a new chicken. So this is actually the third chicken that has been cooked in the same stock. So you get a very, very concentrated flavor. Some recipes ask you to cook the chicken in a lot of water and then reduce it by boiling, but the only effect will be to flavor your curtains. Here, all the flavor is left inside the pot. So here I've got seven and a half deciliters, three cups, of this super concentrated stock to which I'm adding two and a half deciliters. That's one cup of full fat cream. When you have this super concentrated stock, it's always nice to have an element of sweetness as well. So I've taken a pumpkin and just baked it in the oven. And then I've pureed it with a stick blender. So you have something that looks like baby food. And I'm adding three tablespoons of this. And that also adds great color. And then finally, I'm adding a splash of white wine just to give it a little bit acidity as well. You can find all the recipes at our website, newsgangcook.com. This is uh, kind of like a childhood dream for me, or at least a very childish dream, having chicken soup, by the Chicken Falls. And with me to celebrate this moment of triumph, I have the mayor of the town, Kjell B. Hansen. Mr. Mayor, nice to see you. Um, and I'm going to serve the soup with just chunks of uh, chicken meat as well. Well, Mr. Mayor, isn't this a special thing to drink chicken soup by the Chicken Falls? Yes, it is very good. Mm and delicious. Hi, Julie. Hi. Have you more honey to that? Super. 24 glass. Helt perfekt. Perfect. What do you do? Let's have it. I'm going to use Eric's three different types of honey to make a dessert with three different flavors of honey. First, I'm going to start by making a honey ice cream. And for that, I need five deciliters, two cups of milk, two and a half deciliters, one cup of whole fat cream. And I'm sweetening it with the mild and creamy summer honey about half a cup or a little more than a deciliter of that honey. And it's still quite firm now since it's quite cold, but it will dissolve in the warm milk and cream. Meanwhile, I'm adding seven egg yolks to this bowl. Eric's eggs are so beautiful. They all have somewhat different color on the shell and then they've got this deep, yellow orange egg yolk. Just mixing it together. And once the milk, cream and honey mixture is almost boiling, I'm pouring it into the eggs and that will thicken it, hopefully enough to make a good custard as a base for my ice cream. Now I'll let this cool off properly before adding it to the ice cream maker. 
And while the ice cream freezes, I'm going to make a honey crumble. And for that, I'm going to use the virgin honey, the first honey of the season that's even earlier than the summer honey. And I'm uh, making it by simply toasting some uh, breadcrumbs, adding a little bit of honey. At first, it's quite sticky and runny, and then it feels like it dries up. You've got to work it all the time. And when it's like this, it's at its peak. It has started to caramelize a little bit, but if you overdo it, it will start to burn. Then I simply cool it off and mix it in a blender so I have a fine, crunchy crumble. And when you hear that the ice cream machine is struggling, then the ice cream is done. And look at it, it looks fantastic. Now, did I mention that I really want this dessert to taste of honey? So I'm adding just a little more honey. This is the dark autumn honey, the heather honey. I've just warmed it a little so that it's just runny enough. Do you want to taste, Eric? Yes, please. I made dessert with your honey. Ooh. So this is ice cream with your summer honey. It's a crumble with your virgin honey, the early honey, and then there's uh, some uh, heather honey on top. Oh, looks delicious. Mm. It is remarkable that you can sort of have this, this wide variety of flavors, even though it all tastes of honey. <laughs> you know, a lot of different flowers. Mm. While people live to go hunting once a year, what they do every day is eat potatoes. And people here at Ringerike are very serious about their potato. In fact, the local potato has become a national celebrity. And the Ringerike potato is small, kind of ugly, almost impossible to peel, but it is incredibly tasty. So this is the Ringerike potato, and is it it's said to be a local potato variety, but how local can a potato be? You know, all potatoes originally came from uh, South America. So it probably came from there. We don't know when, we don't know how it came here, but my uh, great-great-grandfather started growing it here in this area. Growing it here gave it this very special taste and uh, color, uh, which comes from the nature in this area, the, the, the soil the way it has been grown for now 150 years. So, so you say that it's a little bit like in France with the, with the wine growing, that you, it's not just a vine and you put it into the soil, it's the fact that it's grown there over time, what the French refer to as terroir. That's the word. We unfortunately don't have that word in Norwegian, but terroir, it has to do with the geography, mm. the soil, uh, the way and the techniques of growing it. Mm. And, and the climate, of course, which is very special here. We don't have too much rain, but we have rain. We have a pretty good temperature uh, in the growing season. And, and it makes it um, uh, a special potato with a distinct taste. And it tastes a lot. And that's why it has been so popular for 150 years and that we still actually grow it here. Torbjörn Rud Hotel used to be a well-renowned conference hotel. There's uh, nothing wrong with that, but not terribly exciting either, if you ask me. Then the owner, Olav Lee Nielsen, decided that he wanted to do more. He wanted the hotel to interact with its unique surroundings. He wanted to turn it into a beacon of local food. So he started working differently, started collaborating with local farmers and producers and in the end, they became one. They transformed the way they worked. And the most lovely example of that transformation is that they turned the former pool area into a dairy where they make excellent cheeses. And what was once a normal ornamental garden 
is now the kitchen garden that they use every day. For main course today, I'm going to make mousse sirloin. Sirloin is one of the cuts that finds the balance between having a lot of taste and being quite tender. It's from that part here on the back. And I'm going to serve it with the lovely local Eringerik potatoes that are really flavorful. And I'm going to use them in a gratin with some Jerusalem artichokes from just over there. This is a very quick and efficient way to smash the potatoes and crush them a bit. Some recipes call for pressing the potatoes through a sieve, for instance, but that's only necessary if you want it, the gratin to be super soft. I think that it can be quite as interesting to have chunks of potato in the gratin or in a potato puree or mash. And then I add some cream and some of the lovely local cheese. And I'm just gonna flavor it with some thyme, which is quite nearby. I love it when you just grab a handful of herbs and end up with two different herbs. Here's a combination of normal thyme and lemon thyme. So there's just a little hint of uh, that lemony sweetness to it as well. And then just sprinkle with a little more cheese and bake in the oven at 350 degrees Fahrenheit, 175 centigrade for about 30 minutes. Mousse is game, but it's one of the milder game meats. So you gotta be a little bit careful when you're flavoring it. So I'm simply gonna flavor it with salt, pepper, and powdered porcini. This is simply dried porcini, dried mushrooms. I'm cooking the meat in a quite special way. I'm using a lot of butter. This is a full stick of butter, more than 100 grams. And I'm continuously spooning the butter over the meat. So that way it gets cooked from all sides. But that's also a great way of cooling off the butter. So the butter doesn't burn. So you get maximum flavor. You get this rich, deep brown butter flavor and the flavor of the browning of the meat. So no rest at any point, and it smells fantastic. So I'm just gonna let the meat rest for a few minutes. I'm gonna use this as a foundation to make a sauce that has all the flavors of the caramelized meat, of the brown butter, and of the porcini. So I'm adding some normal all-purpose flour and making what is termed a roux, the foundation of a sauce. So frying the butter and the flour together. Then I start adding a little bit of stock. This is a good game stock. You can also use a beef stock. And then some cream, about half a cup, a little more than a deciliter. So I've just lightly steamed the kale with some uh, lightly salted water and a little bit of butter. And then I'm adding some black currants. They're actually still blackcurrants on the bushes even though it's late in autumn and they taste fantastic. It doesn't have to be blackcurrants but I think it's nice always to have an element of a berry or a fruit together with game. Remember that you can find all the recipes at our website newscancook.com and here it is sirloin of mousse with potato gratin, game sauce, kale and a little wedge of a grilled pumpkin. Bye-bye.